As I said at the close of the lab session, now it's time for something completely different. No more drugs, no more ooky samples. This is all stuff that's perfectly legal. You can go buy it at a store. Because what we've been working on is the analysis of writing inks on documents. And DART has the advantage in that you can do the analysis with no visible change in the document. So it is non-destructive in the sense of visible. Obviously, it's pulling some chemicals off the surface. So at the molecular level, it must be destructive. But as long as you use a gas temperature that's low enough that you don't singe the paper, there's no visible effect. Uh, the two conventional techniques for ink analysis that document examiners use are uh, optical inspection. Oh, I forgot. I do have this slide at the beginning, which is an outline of what I'm going to say. Uh, first, I'll compare it to the conventional techniques that I just started to make the comparison to. We'll talk about spectrum acquisition. It's a little different for an ink on paper as opposed to something you can get on a glass tube and uh, waggle in front of the instrument. Um, instrumental conditions, also a little different since you do have a document you don't want to damage. Uh, we've been using the NIST mass spectral search program uh, rather than the search from list, so I'll talk about that. It's free software, so it's something everybody can afford. Um, and then this thing specific for our analysis, since it is on paper, what interference from paper there is, since it is an ink that dries over time, what's the effect of the age of the writing, um, a little side note there, we'll get into identifying components, the sort of thing that you've seen everybody else doing, except they were drugs they were identifying. And then finally, identifying the ink itself, the assemblage of peaks, not just one peak like when you're doing a drug, uh, using the NIST software. Okay, as I said, compared to the conventional techniques first, there are two that get a lot of use. One of them is optical inspe inspection. We do side-by-side -side comparison between uh, a known ink and your suspect, or if you've got a document that has two different kinds of ink on it because they've, say, taken a check and forged it by changing the numbers, so there's two inks on there, comparing the two that are already on the document. Basically, all you're doing is looking at it uh, through filters under various illuminations. So you might have ultraviolet illumination, invisible light observation, or it may be visible light illumination and you're observing infrared fluorescence or opacity in the infrared, or even just various colors within the visible. Strengths of that is it's really quick and cheap. All you need are some color filters and some nice light bulbs. Non-destructive, clearly so, and it's often, that's all you need. You know, are these two inks clearly different or not? Weaknesses is, are rather you have to have a physical reference. You have to be comparing your unknown to something that you have a physical sample of right there. It provides minimal information. You know, if, if the two don't match, that's very clearly a, a non-match. It's a negative result. If the two do match, that really doesn't prove they're the same ink, only that they're similar enough that under the particular illuminations and filtering you're using, they look the same. You can't really build a library of data you know, like chips search from list <laughs> to compare inks that way. You definitely cannot identify the ink. The other one that gives you more information is thin layer chromatography or TLC. Again, it's a side-by-side -side comparison. What you do is you take a little of the ink from the document, put it onto a TLC plate, uh, which is basically a porous material. A solvent passes up the plate, which pulls the ink along. Each component of the ink travels at a different speed up the plate as the solvent travels along, so you end up with a series of spots, either colored spots or fluorescent spots. So the only things you detect are things that are either colored, like the dyes that are in the ink, or that fluoresce under ultraviolet. Uh, disadvantage is that a lot of inks now have pigments in them, and they are particulate in nature, so they don't uh, travel with the solvent. So you just end up with a splotch at the beginning uh, rather than getting a spot a certain distance up. Strengths, again, it's really cheap. It's usually sufficient, gives you more data than the optical inspection. Uh, 
And you can build a library. The Secret Service does have a physical library of a large number of thin layer chromatography plates they have developed for comparing to. And I understand they are trying to digitize the data from that, although I don't know any of the details. I'm not sure if it's a series of images or a series of, okay, uh, this distance it's a blue spot and this distance it's a red spot, that sort of thing. You may be able to identify the ink more or less since the series of spots can be fairly characteristic for an ink. Weaknesses, it's slow. You've got to let this solvent uh, develop the thing. It is destructive. You've got to take the ink off the document. You still have to have your physical reference even if you're using, you know, a library of TLC plates that you've got on hand like the Secret Service. You've got to have those plates. You can't have just a data file. Uh, it is sensitive to environment. Uh, you get different distances that the spots travel on a different day if the humidity is different, if the uh, concentration of vapor of the solvent is a bit different in the development chamber, and certainly less information than you can get from DART. So comparing that to DART, we already know. You get the elemental formula and maybe even the identity of components in the ink. It's basically limited to the volatile and semi-volatile components. DART doesn't do pigments either because they don't evaporate. They simply don't come off. Strengths, very quick, as you've seen, non-destructive, as I'm claiming. <laughs> no physical reference necessary. All you need is a database. It provides lots of information, more than you'll ever want. <laughs> you can identify the ink, or at least that's my claim. And it's complementary to the other techniques because since it's working with volatile and semi-volatiles, it doesn't see a whole lot of the dye. You do see a little bit, but it's not the major peak in the mass spectrum. So it's complementary to the others that are looking at the dye spots or the, the color of the ink when it's under a certain illumination. So it doesn't rely on the dyes the way the others do. Weaknesses, it's expensive. And you've got to be well trained in it, as you found. It, it is sensitive to the vehicle. You do get lots of peaks from the vehicle. That can be characteristic of the ink, so it's helpful in one way. The other problem is if the ink is really fresh, you're getting volatiles that will come off as that ink dries in the first two or three or four weeks after it's written. So that spectrum of a very fresh ink looks quite different from one that's been on the paper for a year, say. And the paper itself can occasionally interfere. That had been a, our biggest worry when we started was it turned out that the paper would be a problem in everything. Usually it's not, thankfully. Uh, we did start doing originally conventional mass spectra. You know, we took a little sample of the ink, extracted it, and then ran that by uh, ESI mass spec to get a spectrum of the extract. But we ran into problems like this. Here are five different big black ballpoints. And the mass spectra are virtually identical because it's just the dye. 372 is crystal violet, a dye that is in almost every black ballpoint pen out there. And 358 is methyl violet, which is a, is a compound similar to crystal violet. It's usually in crystal violet dyes that the ink manufacturers use because the material is not a pure compound. Compare that to the uh, five spectra of the same inks done by DART. Let's see if the pen actually works. Well, it does for a moment, then it goes out. <laughs> and this is brand new. <laughs> okay, do it barehanded. You can see there's a lot more peaks in these. There are certainly similarities among them. They've all got this 367 peak nice and prominent. Uh, they've all got 139 here, nice and prominent, so on and so forth. Uh, you may notice that there's no 372. There's almost no dye there at all. And it turns out that crystal violet is an unusual compound. It shows up in an odd space, place. It's 374. So it's that little bitty peak there. And the same little bitty peak is in all of these. So yeah, the dye is present, but it certainly doesn't dominate your data. You've seen this picture before, or almost. I've added a little thing just to show how we put the paper sample in. I say it's non-destructive, and yet you've got this little bitty gap you've got to fit it into. Well, what we've done is we've got a, a metal mandrel with a round nose, and we simply wrap the paper around it. So there's no crease. 
and we have a, I'll show you in a moment, uh, the actual holder, and there's a metal plate that hooks around the mandrel to hold the paper in place. In fact, here is the holder, and you'll see it live when we go down to the lab. This thing that bolts on here, it's got a whole eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in there. This is the round nose mandrel, and actually what you see is the metal hook that goes around it to hold it in place. Uh, there is a hinge right there, so that once the sample has been put in, out here in the open where we can see what we're doing, the whole thing flops over to drop the sample into just the right space in front of the dart source so it gets sampled. So nice and reproducible, no waggling of glass tubes or anything like that. Don't have to hold your tongue in the right place. It just, <laughs> it just is the same every time. Uh, top view of this, this now shows you the little metal hook that goes around the thing to hold the page in. If I were redesigning this, I probably would have made it somewhat wider. It does tend to put uh, slight creases into something that's eight and a half inches wide. But we do a lot of sampling with very small things. Since we're not working with documents, we do tend to punch little holes and actually use the little hole as our sample piece so we can keep the large piece of paper as a backup for repeated sampling. If we go in nice and close on that, you can see now the hook that goes over, and it's got this little slot in it. That's an eighth of an inch wide. So that actually defines the area that gets sampled, and that's typical. We just have a straight line. If it's a sample we made up so it's not handwriting you know, letters, just a straight line, an eighth of an inch wide, and that's enough of a sample. Thanks to this hook being curved, all this you see up here is actually further back behind this plane, so the dart gas stream doesn't see that, that this is out of way and it's not getting sampled. Just that little spot is what gets tested and might be molecularly altered, although as I say, it's not visibly changed. And here it is once you've uh, flopped it over at the hinge and the thing is now down in place. Obviously you would have trouble getting it in there if that hinge wasn't like that, if you had to try to mount it in place. And looking from the side, you can now see here's the white button and the uh, cone of uh, acceptance, and here's the hook and that bright light off the edge of the uh, eighth inch wide slot. So it's simply held in there in that line and don't have to have nice and steady hands, don't have to waggle it just the right way. Okay, so the conditions we use, which are the ones that the instrument almost always starts out in and then chip or whoever has been changing <laughs> during the other sessions. We've been using three and a quarter liters per minute of helium. That's really not very sensitive. You can alter that as you wish. Higher gas flow does give a cooler gas stream, basically. Uh, we've had the needle at 3,500 volts. That's also typical, but not very sensitive. We've had the electro first electrode at 150. That's also not very sensitive thing. We have had the grid electrode at plus 650. We set that originally because we were having trouble with the background. We were having lots of stuff in our background at one point. And we found a higher voltage damped that down. Uh, now I've seen the people here turn that back down to like 150, 250 or so. so and it seems to have cleaned up. Uh, over the months that we've used it, the background seems to have gone down. So we may actually drop that, but all the data I will show you was taken with the 650. Uh, we haven't played with that at all. It's been the typical 20 volts, 80 degrees Celsius that Joel sets up the inlet. And <laughs> nobody's played with that except for Bob, <laughs> who has his own uh, agenda. <laughs> and the mount that I showed you is actually wired to this inlet. So it's at the same voltage. It's at this plus 20 volts. We originally had the thing grounded simply because it bolted to the side of the spectrometer. And that does reduce the signal if this is at ground so that this and this are both at a higher voltage. It's not really a good idea electronically. <laughs> so at Chip's suggestion, uh, we broke the connection to ground and wired it to the inlet and that does help. Oh, and the gas heater temperature, we tend to run lower than 
the drugs people seem to be doing, simply because at 255, we don't scorch the paper. There's no visible change. If you run at 300, you're going to scorch your paper. <laughs> uh, here's the sort of data treatment we do. Here's the uh, ubiquitous PEG 600. Since we are running on paper as a background, we do have to run a blank of paper and then the ink on paper. And that's a typical sort of pattern we get in terms of the signal. There'll be a, a sudden rise and then it'll fall off and not quite go back to zero until we take the sample out. Since we don't know exactly when the ink is going to stop, because sometimes there's a second peak, sometimes it dribbles on for a while, we've simply come up with always sampling uh, when we take data 30 seconds from the start of the peak. So we average those 30 seconds and we get these sorts of spectra. Here's the one for the blank paper. Here's the one for the ink on paper. Obviously the ink adds a whole lot, although the paper is obviously interfering. The, this big 279 peak is clearly present in that. And there's all this hash down here, which really has nothing to do with the ink. It's coming from the paper. So we do subtract the blank paper off. So one-to-one -one subtraction here, and out comes this spectrum. All that hash of small peaks that have nothing to do with the ink are gone. 279 didn't quite disappear in this particular subtraction, but it's nearly gone. And if that's by far the biggest peak in the paper, then the paper interference we can claim is pretty much gone at that point. And that's certainly good enough that we could identify the ink. Okay, ink spectra. Ink, uh, basically handwriting ink at least, comes in three kinds. There's the ballpoints, there are the gel inks, and then there's a big category called fluid inks, which are roller balls, felt tips, just about anything that isn't a gel or a ballpoint. And you can see the spectra do differ quite a lot. Ballpoints distinctively tend to have a large number of peak above 200, and not a whole lot down here once the ink is old. If the ink is still fairly fresh, you'll have uh, solvent peaks, vehicle peaks in here. The gel and the roller ball to the casual eye don't look a whole lot different as a group, but individual inks certainly will look a lot different from one another. Uh, as I said, I'm going to use the NIST spectral search software, which you have seen. And the advantage of it is that the demo version which is fully functional, is a free download, so it doesn't cost you anything. The only thing you don't get is the big library of spectra. But if you're doing inks, that library isn't a whole lot of use to you because there aren't any ink spectra in the commercial library. <laughs> so for us, it served our purposes, and we had started using that in a previous project uh, before we had Dart or anything like that. So we've just stuck with this rather than switching over to the search from list from Chip. So you'll get to see a different piece of software in the lab today. Uh, the NIST software can do a lot of different types of searches. It can do spectral matching, can be reverse or forward, uh, by which I mean a forward search. The spectrum of your unknown is used as the model. It compares to the library entries only those peaks that are in the unknown. So if the library entry has more peaks than your unknown, it's not devalued as a result. The comparison doesn't care. Reverse is the other way around. The library is used as the model. And so the peaks in the library spectrum that you're comparing, where they fall, is the important thing. So if the library does have extra peaks that are not in your unknown, that um, decreases the quality of the match between the two. Uh, you can set MZ limits if you want to avoid that section down at the low end where the volatiles are and change as the ink ages. Uh, there's identity versus similarity searches. You can have it match ring number, which is not important for inks, but can be for other things. You don't have to search spectra. It'll also search formulas, names, cast numbers, NIST registry numbers, and individual peaks. Constraints you can put on the searches of the molecular weight, uh, elemental abundances, presence or absence of certain peaks. So it's a fairly versatile software. This is the results page. Uh, you, you've seen it quickly. I don't think anyone has described it during any of the lab sessions. This is the results page when you do a search. What you have at the 
top is simply the listing of the unknown you've just run. So that's something you already know. Down at the, uh, next to it is the spectrum of the unknown. You can have it showing just the mass spectrum like that as a plot, or you can have it also listing the 10 largest peaks and their intensities, if you want that data as well. You can see these three little tabs, and those are three different ways of displaying the data, so you can, the dis display is fairly versatile. Down here at the bottom is the list of matches in order of quality of the match. So the closest match is going to be the first one, second closest match will be next down, and so on. So you've got all those to look at to see which one matches best with that. Uh, just above it, in between the unknown and the list, is this distribution, which is a plot of these matches plotted against their match quality. So this one here is the best match, then there's apparently a couple that fall into that category, the next best matches, and so on. So you can see how the distribution of your matches are against your unknown. Down here at the bottom is a spectrum display just like this one, except it's for one of the library entries, and it's whichever one you've highlighted. So you can click on one of these entries, and up pops its mass spectrum. And it has the same, well, I've covered it up with this label, but the same three tabs appear down here, so you can again play with those. And this last window here is a comparison between these two. And again, there are four tabs here, different ways of doing it. The one I happen to have up here is the difference, where it's taken this one and subtracted this one from it and shown the difference, which isn't very big since this is a really good quality match that I'm showing. <laughs> but you can also do the, the mirror displays that I've noticed Chip has had in some of his, where you've got one spectrum going up and one spectrum going down. I think they call it head to tail here. <laughs> so there are a number of different displays you can use. I talked about the, the match quality. I don't think anyone's done anything at all on how that is done with one of these mass spectra. This is the way it's done in the NIST software, and I think you use the same algorithm in the search for list, don't you? Yeah. I stole everything from the <laughs> I'm not going to go into great detail. Anyone who wants the detail, this article here out of the Journal of American Society of Mass Spectros Spectrometry gives all the detail. Basically, the match quality is based on two factors, F1 and F2, really invent little names. F1 is this combination where they're summing, summing over M, which is the mass over charge ratio. So it's the intensity of the library and the unknown peak at mass M, summing all those together. And the sum is done, depending on whether it's a forward or reverse search, over either the library or the unknown peaks. So forward and reverse is which entries appear in each of these sums. So that's one of the factors. The other factor is this one, where again you have the same intensities, but you're comparing successive intensities within a mass spectrum. So they've got this index i. So this is the ith peak in the spectrum, and this is the ith minus 1 peak in the spectrum. So that's to help you with things like isotope ratios. Now, if they have the same isotope ratios in both of those uh, spectra, you'll tend to get a higher value for this F2. And then the F1 and F2 are combined in this way. The Ns are simply the number of peaks in the spectra. Nu is the number in the unknown. Nu plus L is the number in the unknown and the library added together, so it's covering every peak that's in either one of them. So you add that up, throw in a factor of 999, so a perfect match comes out to be 999. Why they do it that way, I don't know, <laughs> but that is the perfect number. Okay, going on to actual some of the tests we did. We, as I said, our first worry was, is the paper affecting the spectra? Is it going to keep us from being able to identify things? So, excuse me, we wrote freehand lines on 16 different types of paper with one ink from each of those three categories I talked about, a ballpoint, a gel, and a fluid ink. And then we put them away in a drawer for eight or nine months since we didn't want to look at absolutely fresh ink. We wanted them to be aged ink as you would normally find. 
We then took those out and we require, acquired three spectra from each of the inks on each of the papers. And we did sa uh, handle the samples with gloves because as you've seen, a dart can pick up fingerprints. So if you handle the paper, the sample, and then put it in, you're gonna see mostly fingerprints. So that is one disadvantage. Instead of having to waggle the uh, little glass tube, you have to put on gloves. We then put all of those spectra into uh, the NIST library and did searches to see how well the match qualities were for the same ink on the various 16 different papers. Here's the 16 different papers we used. Uh, 10 of them are just plain old ordinary white office paper for the most part. Uh, it's a rather thick uh, sort of thing you'd uh, put your resume on. Uh, ordinary copy paper. Uh, here's a gloss paper like you might put a photograph on. So a variety of white office papers. A couple of envelopes, a brown manila one and a nice white uh, letterhead sort of envelope and some miscellaneous kinds, you know, legal pad, a piece of colored paper, a yellow post-it note, filter paper, uh, a note paper that has printing on it, you know, nice pattern, you know, smiling snowmen or flowers or something like that, uh, which the writing is then on top of that printed ink. Okay, here's a distribution of the match qualities we got for one particular sample. It's a black zebra rubber 80 ballpoint ink on hammer mill 4 DP paper. That one particular spectrum we took matched against all the other spectra for that same ink on a different paper. So we didn't look at any more hammer mill 4 papers, but the other 15 papers. And it, this was the distribution of the match qualities for all 45 of those samples it was matched against. And that's pretty good if 999 is perfect. You know, the, the average turned out, or the median at least, turned out to be 880. There were, however, three down here that <laughs> did not behave. Same ink, but on a different paper, and they came out really lousy. So when we looked at the distribution, we found that all three were from the same paper. It came from Hammer Mill Color Laser Gloss Paper. It was the one glossy paper in our set. So we looked more closely at that and we found, well, the gloss paper has a very strong dart spectrum all on its own, much stronger than the other papers we tried. So that was the problem. That paper was an interference. So at least for this black ballpoint, we could say, yeah, occasionally the paper is going to interfere if it's a special paper with a lot of coating on it or something that makes it have a good strong dart spectrum. Here, to give you an example of how of what those match quality numbers mean, I've got four spectra from that match I was just discussing. Here at the top is the unknown, that zebra ink on hammer mill 4 DP paper. Here's the closest match the one that had the highest match quality clear out at this end on the distribution happened to be a manila envelope. And there are differences. The match quality is 925, which is pretty good, but there's clearly some differences in the relative heights of the big peaks. But most of the peaks are there in roughly the right uh, ratios. It's really just this big one that's down, it seems. These others are in about the right ratio. So that's a pretty good match. The Worst match, other than those glossy papers, is this one. Match quality of 816, happened to be the yellow post-it note. It still has most of the same peaks. We've begun to lose uh, or at least shrink down some of the small things in between, which is probably why it's down in the 800s instead of up in the 900s. And here is one of the laser glosses, laser gloss papers, and it's clearly different. <laughs> That's the interference from the paper. The biggest peaks in here are paper peaks. If you do follow down, you do find that the ink peaks are in there. They're just not dominating the spectrum, and that's why the match is so poor. So if the paper is not got a strong spectrum of its own, it doesn't get in the way, at least of the ballpoints that we looked at. Now what I showed you before looked a lot like this, but it was the match for one sample against all of the inks. Could you subtract out a blank pa a paper blank for that? Yes, all the the, the uh, spectra here have had the paper 
blank subtracted off. Wow. The, uh, so so e even all... this one, the laser gloss, has had the paper subtracted off. It's just such a strong spectrum, and the relative heights of things do change from one sampling to the next that we were never able to get reliably a really clean separation. If we ran several blanks and then tried to come up with by eye the best subtraction, we could do better than what I'm showing you. But this is the sort of thing where you take an honest spectrum of the ink and an honest blank and subtract them without second guessing the result. Let me interrupt you. Can you ask that question again, please, the first one? You don't have to answer it. Just, I just want to get it on tape if you would ask it. Thank you. Um, what I was asking was whether you could subtract out a, a paper blank. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> I think this is where I was. This time I'm showing a distribution of the median match quality. So we've taken all 48 of those spectra run through all the matches of those 48 against all the other on different papers, so 45 matches for each one, and found where the median for all 48 of those samples are and plotted the medians. So we don't get it quite as high up here because no median gets really high up in there. But we find again that the only three bad actors are those laser gloss papers. Their medians are bad simply because they don't match with anything else. But everything else does pretty good, 750 up. I'd like to see it above 800, but 750 isn't too bad for a, a random set of samples. We did the same thing for a gel and a, a microphone tie. The light on. Can I just ask how the test samples were prepared? For example, did you write in series through the different types of paper? Did you take a break? Uh, did you always go on the same trying to remember because I did that. Uh, I took a sheet of paper and had all the pens out in front of me and simply went through and wrote with each one of them. So there was about a, a one inch strip on each of the papers. So it usually took two sheets of paper to get them all on there. And a series of little straight lines. So it was freehand writing, but not actual letters, just but lines. But did you alter the order of the papers? These? Or was well, it as always, I, for example, the post it came first? Or uh, <laughs> as I said, I wrote all the samples for a given paper at one time. So the I did all the post-it notes together mm -hmm. and then all the laser gloss paper together. So I successfully did all inks on one paper, then all inks on another paper. And I did that all in one day, which was like eight or nine months before, we, or whatever I had on the slide, something like eight or nine months before we did the analysis. <laughs> Shall I lean over and let you use this mic? I was just wondering how the samples were produced on the different types of paper, if they were produced in sequence, or if you altered the order of the papers when you produced the writing. <laughs> Onward, let's see. Gel inks. Okay, this is like the first slide I showed for the ballpoints. It's distribution of match qualities for one spectrum. Uh, black big crystal gel roller. Again on hammer mill 4 DP. I've just used hammer mill 4 DP as the example throughout just so it's always on the same paper. And the similar sort of thing. There's a distribution with a median match quality of 854. It's a little lower than the ballpoints. The ballpoints turned out to be the nicest ones. They tend to work best of all the ink types. Gels were somewhat lower, but still quite good. Heck, we, we've got a, a match out here that's in the 960 to 80 category, so close to darn perfect. A few distribution here of uh, bad ones. Nothing in this particular ink spectrum you know, didn't have all three of a particular paper here. When we looked at the medians of all the gel inks, there weren't really any bad actors. There wasn't anything that uh, was a problem for the gel inks. Even the laser gloss tended to work pretty well. We think that's because the gel just sat on top better and gave a stronger spectrum relative to the laser gloss. 
So the jails work pretty well. The, the distribution has moved down a little bit from the ballpoints, but still pretty good. Fluids were something of another matter. Here again is the match qualities for a single fluid ink on Hammer Mill 4 paper. <laughs> There's really no peak. <laughs> you know, it's just spread all over the place, going from some really excellent matches to some really lousy ones. Match quality was 777, so it's moved down a bit more from even the gels. When we look at the medians for all of the gel inks, there is at least now a, a nice distribution to them. It is moved down below 800, though, and we do have a few that are bad actors. But they were almost all from two kinds of paper. Our favorite, the color laser gloss paper, and Crane's resume paper, which is a particularly thick paper. Fluid inks sink into paper. So the very thick ink, uh, thick paper rather, uh, is simply blotting up the ink. Most of the sample is below the surface where the dart is not getting to it. So the fluid inks in general give weaker spectra than the others simply because they aren't evolving off the paper. They're sort of hidden underneath, so they soak in. And if it's a particularly heavy paper like the Crane's resume, that problem is exacerbated. So for the fluids, we have the same sort of problem as with the ballpoints. You can have interference with a spectrum that has a lot of spectrum of its own, and any thick paper is going to be a problem. So in general, that's the sort of paper interferences we've found with the inks. Now on to the subject of writing age. I have a ah, quick question. Okay. How was your standards prepared? Um, when you recorded the ink in your reference, did you write it on a paper? Was it just the ink on the end of a glass? Uh, yeah. how, how well, I'm not sure ink? what you mean by standard. Uh, your, what, your, your inks that um, you put into your reference library to do these matches, mm -hmm. um, were they just the inks? that you scanned into the dart, no. or were they... Well, uh, uh, what we had was the inks on the 16 papers. We ran three spectra for each of those inks on each of those papers. So when we're looking at a particular ink, uh, the ballpoint, there would be 48 spectra, you know, three on 16. What we did was we took each one of those, 48, and searched it against the others that were on different papers, oh, so 45. So it was a self-referenced, as it were. There weren't a separate set of standards. Uh, we matched, you know, the library against itself. Okay. Yeah, I, I, when you were talking about subtracting out the paper from the ink, so I, I was curious if you had a pure ink reference spectra. Not in the way of having the ink never see paper. Okay. Uh, our our standards if we want to use that term, and I don't think it's quite the right term to use, our spectra we've taken and subtracted a blank paper from. So all the spectra I'm showing you and all the data I'm doing, like all these match quality medians and all those, are based on spectra where the blank paper has been subtracted off. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask that again, just to make sure. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> um, how, how were the um, pure inks prepared to be used in your reference spectra, um, library matches and so forth. Okay. Obviously the rule is write down your question first because you're yeah, going to have to say it a couple of times. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh yes, writing age. Similar sort of modus operandi here. We again wrote lines freehand periodically on some paper. Our favorite Hammer Mill 4DP. You know, every week or every two weeks, we'd simply write some straight lines on the paper, put a date by them so we knew when we wrote them, and store them back away in the desk drawer. After we had like 11 months of these samples built up, we then ran spectra on them. As I say, we handled them with gloves, so we didn't put fingerprints on them during the analysis. We did not necessarily have gloves on when we wrote them originally. Uh, again, we took three spectra at each age, and this time we averaged them just so we'd have a nice spectrum since in any one spectrum a peak could go up and down some, and this time we were trying to do plots over time of peaks. 
so we wanted the peaks to be a little more reproducible than usual. And here for a black ball point, we see spectra at four days of age and at about 11 months of age. And there's a lot of changes, yes. There are a whole lot of peaks here from volatile things that have either completely disappeared like 199 or have shrunk quite a bit like 100 here, which is still present after 11 months, but a whole lot smaller. In general, in the ball points, we found that the peaks above around 250 or so don't change very much. They appear to be fairly stable. There's small changes in here, but most of those peaks are still, that are here at four days, are still here at 11 months. And as I mentioned before, 374 is the die peak. Now that may seem strange, but I'll get to that shortly. We can do, oh, have you written your question down? <laughs> it's oh, I'm sure I write it down so I can say it twice. <laughs> um, it, it seems to make sense that it would go based on just simply the aging of volatiles that would leave. But how have you controlled for, let the cart go by here. Um, <laughs> oh, is there any difference in the ink at this end of the reservoir and this end of the reservoir that maybe some of those changes are simply because that pen was now used, the, the ink that you started out with for the four day sample that you used four days ago was different yeah. than the ink from the same pen? We have not done ago. any tests on that ourselves. There is one article I know of in the literature where the title is something like, does the ink in a pen cartridge age? Uh, I'd have to look it up. I've forgotten now the authors or anything like that. They did use, darn, I can't remember if it was mass spec or a chromatography method. It was something certainly better than TLC to look at samples taken from both inks, both ends of a cartridge to see if uh, things had changed over time. And they found that only right there at the tip where you might have a little infiltration of air did they see any alteration. It was basically nice and uniform once you got away from the ball and the ballpoint. So I don't think so. Uh, and of course we were only writing, you know, maybe 18 inches of ink line on a given day. So that's not, not going through a lot of ink. We knew we were going to be writing samples weekly for about a year, so, so we didn't want to run out of ink pins halfway like through. I'm always losing my pins. <laughs> we can do the same sort of thing that you've already seen from all the other instructors, <clears throat> where we identify individual peaks. Here's what we did for the peaks in that big ballpoint. Uh, here's the uh, formulas we matched up with, and you can see it's a pretty close match between the observed M over Z and the actual one for this formula. Um, nothing really surprising. In the top of the table, we have pyrrolidone, phenoxyethanol, which is really common solvent in ballpoint inks. Uh, this formula, there's all sorts of different uh, fragrant liquids, esters and such. So a whole variety that could be that one. We did come across one where we simply couldn't come up with a formula that matched that that corresponded to an industrial chemical. You know, you can come up with exotic things. Uh, we, we keep hitting drugs or biological <laughs> compounds that we knew weren't in the ink. So things like that. And now I'll get to this one, 374, which I claim is crystal violet. Problem is it matches the crystal violet formula only if we add two hydrogens instead of one. Well, crystal violet isn't a neutral molecule. It's different. Its spectrum is, the, uh, its structure is this. It's an ion. So it's already ionized, sitting on the paper. So really all it's doing is it's being volatilized. And apparently H2 is being added across a double bond someplace to get up to 374. Now, the very original stuff we did, which I'm not actually reporting because it was so early on, I did with Chip. I went to Joel and we spent a couple of days sticking a bunch of ink on paper samples in front of the instrument to see, does this work at all? Does it make any sense? And we couldn't find the dye peak. And I, fi I think I finally figured out that, gee, every one of these ballpoints has 374 in it. 
Is there any way that could possibly happen? And, you know, as Pete and Bob have said, when we have a problem, we ask Chip. <laughs> so and Chip came up with the idea that, well, yeah, since it is already ionized, it could be adding hydrogen to H2 to it. And he ran a sample, and you never did send me that spectrum. So I reran the sample of pure crystal violet, and here's what I got. And yeah, we do see 372 when the crystal violet is all by itself. Now, in the ink on the paper, that's apparently getting repressed. That's not showing up too well. And there's 373 here, which is the protonated, or H added on to crystal violet. But there's a fairly good amount of 2H plus there as well. And these other things, we're adding water, we're adding oxygen, methyl violet, I already mentioned that, that's there. Never could figure out what the 345 is. But that was a rather old dye sample. It was around the lab for about 10 years, so <laughs> it may have degraded a little. But yes, 374 is definitely coming from the crystal violet. Here's a time plot now. We're looking at various of the peaks, shown here, as a function of time and looking at their relative intensities compared to the M over Z 367 peak, which at long times is the biggest peak. It's the base peak for an old ink. And you can see there's a whole bunch of those peaks that are stable. They really don't change over time. And they tend to be high mass, at least from 150 up. There's also a bunch that are changing over time. Most of them seem to be going down towards zero and are pretty much gone after 11, 12 months. The phenoxyethanol at 139 seems to be sort of leveling off. We're not quite sure about that. Uh, so it may actually stabilize at some low value. But certainly there are some solvents that disappear fairly quickly. There are some that, although they may eventually disappear, they're going to be around for a few years. So you do need to keep track of them in the spectra of the ink if you want to identify the ink. And then there are a bunch of things that are stable over time, that are truly characteristic of the ink. Yes? I have a question, and you may have said this already, but as you're um, taking the mass spec of the um, age samples, are you taking a new blank each time, or a blank of your paper as well each time, or are you comparing it to the blanks that you created? Taking a blank from near the same spot as the ink on paper sample is being done. Uh, the, the lines are, I didn't know how big our samplings were going to be, so I sometimes ended up with the ink lines too close together to get a fully blank piece of paper from between them. So occasionally I'd have to be a couple of inches off, but <laughs> usually it was within an inch of where the ink on paper spectrum sample had been drawn. Do the same sort of thing for gel ink, much sparser spectrum of the ballpoints. Uh, again, good changes between a week old and 11 months old. Uh, you know, 301 disappeared completely, but some peaks are there nice and strong all the way through. No surprises really with that. You can do. Uh, oh, okay. I don't. <laughs> I think it's a proton bound dimer from the 150. Let's see, I can't do that math in my head. I thought that was going to be too far off. You know, that'd be 300.228 plus a hydrogen. Plus 149. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Maybe it isn't. No, it can't be. You're right. <laughs> well, I'm reasonably certain that it's one of these two. The problem is the observed mass is exactly between the two. <laughs> you know, it's, it's six millimass units off of either of them. <laughs> so, uh, could be either of those. Those are both industrial chemicals, so I don't know. The rest, lots of glycols. We find glycols in just about every ink, even the fluid inks, which are usually called water-based. They've got glycol in them. Uh, diethanolamine is very common in the uh, gel inks. So, no great surprises in those. Here again is the time evolution of some of the peaks. Again, some are nice and steady. Uh, occasionally we found one that just hopped all over the place. We're not quite sure why. 
there'd just be one peak in the spectrum or two peaks in the spectrum that would do that. Others drop off real fast and disappear. You may notice that this green one, the red one, and the blue one all seem to be coming up slowly rather than being absolutely steady. We think that's because the base peak at 150 is actually coming down very slowly. So the ones that are truly steady, since I'm basically ratioing against the 150 peak, are seen to be coming up relative to it. Okay, last example of, for aging fluid inks. Lots more peaks, lots of changes again. If we look at the uh, four day old ink here, it may be hard to see, but there's actually a nice spacing of peaks in here. There are three different series that have a spacing of 44. If I colorize them, click like that, so that you now see the red here at 211, 55, 99, spacing of 44, the magenta, magenta 195, 239, 283, and so on, spacing of 44, blue one, 212, 56, 300, so on. Again, spacing 44. In fact, a spacing of 44.026, which is the exact mass for C2H4O. It's a unit of ethylene glycol. So these are all polyethylene glycols of some sort, three different series of polyethylene glycols. And let's see, the red series of these turns out not to be very stable. They're almost all gone. 299 is there a little bit after 11 months. The magenta series is the most stable of them. It's the base peak, 239 is a magenta peak in both of them, and 283 and 195 are still present after a long time. There is one oddity, which maybe you've noticed, a peak that is there at long times and not there at the beginning. 403 isn't there in the fresh ink. It appears over time. We don't know what it is. And we've seen that in a few cases. It happened to appear in one that we made lots of samples over different ages, so we could actually follow it. <laughs> uh, but that was accidental. We didn't know it was there when we started collecting samples. So apparently it is possible for some inks to react with something in the air, with something in the paper, we don't know what, and produce a species of some sort. It's not real common, but it can occur. Here again is the uh, analysis of the peaks. We have our magenta series, which turn out to have this formula. In other words, they're just a bunch of polyethylene glycols. The red series, which has this polyethylene glycol unit, and then it has C8H10 left over that has to be attached to the two ends of the molecule. And the easiest way of splitting up C8H10 is if it's a polyethylene glycol ethylphenyl diether. So you've got an ethyl on one end and a phenyl on the other. Could be a different sort of thing. You could have methyl on one end and toluyl on the other, but that's a more complicated molecule. So our probable identity is the ethyl phenyl diether. And then there's the blue series, which actually there are two possibilities. You could have C16H20 on polyethylene glycol or C7H12N2 on polyethylene glycol. So it's some series of polyethylene glycols, so we're not quite sure which. But all of this peak identity is really not necessary for identifying the ink, because when you're identifying the ink, you're identifying the fingerprint pattern of all the peaks together as an assemblage, rather than identifying a particular peak. So it doesn't matter if we don't know the identity of these. As long as we know these peaks always appear, in that Mont Blanc ink. So we didn't spend a whole lot of time figuring out peak identity. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure uh, Chip will be able to tell me what a lot of these are because he has a whole lot more software than I do <laughs> and can do these things a lot faster. The, the 301 is the proton bond dimer of the 151 peak. And, and the mass comes out 0.24 millimass units. So that's, that's what it is. And that's why it goes away. And the, uh, the black bit crystal gel. 301 is a dimer probably. of 151? 151. 151 is pro M plus H plus the 150. And if you look at the exact mass you measured, it comes out dead on for the proton bound dimer okay. for that. Well, then it's not a dimer of 151. It's 151 plus 150. Right. Plus H. Right. The, the, the neutral component is 150. 
you measure at 151 peak as an M plus H. The 2M plus H is 301, and, and the mass is dead on for that. So that's C12H 2908. <laughs> we'll have to figure this out. Anyway, <laughs> you, you won't see it if you do the, the compound search unless you set a really high negative uh, unsaturation because it's non-covalently bound. I'll show you later. Okay, that may have been why it wasn't turning up on anything. <laughs> but that's why that's why the high mass peak goes away with time because it's not really a high mass compound. It's it's a proton bound dimer of a smaller, more volatile compound. That, that one got me wondering because you had a high mass peak going away with time, and and we just saw the opposite on an earlier example. Mm -hmm. So it got me wondering what was going on there. Well, of course, disappearance over time means volatility. Right. Which certainly tends to track with molecular weight, but doesn't right. have to. Right. So certainly there are high molecular weight peaks that disappear, sure. simply because it's a volatile compound. Yeah. At least we have an, exam an uh, explanation for this particular one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, here's the time plots, like you've seen for the other inks for the Mont Blanc pen. Again, we have some that are reasonably stable, a bunch this time that are going down towards zero. Our one weirdo here, the mass 403, which it was like three or four months into it before it started to appear. And if you look at the p little dots, you see that it stays zero until that one. And I got that one, I said, hmm, new peak? Yeah, probably a mistake, it's not very big. Because <laughs> the next time I ran it, it was down again. <laughs> I said, okay, it's still there, but it must be a contaminant. I must, you know, fingerprint, I must be doing something slightly wrong. But then next three were all up and going higher. So if I ignore that one that's off the trend, that's a pretty good line through them. I must admit I haven't run it again to see you know, if it's still going up. I suspect not, but uh, we ran out of time at that point. That was the end of the project. So, okay, now on to the, what for us was the important thing. It was what we were trying to demonstrate with the whole project is can one identify reliably an ink in terms of its make and model from its start mass spectrum by looking at it on paper. No, not the pure ink, just on paper. So we build up a library of DART spectra, 166 different inks, 76 ballpoints, 50 fluids, 40 gels. Uh, most of them were written two or three years before the analysis. A few were written as late as 10 months before the analysis. So they're all either thoroughly aged or pretty close to that. What we did, we took two spectra of each ink and placed them in the NIST library. So there'd be two entries for each ink. Uh, every spectrum then in the library was taken out as tested as an unknown. Of course, I got a perfect match with itself because it's in the library. But then there were all the other matches. We considered the ink as being identified correctly is the next match down the one not with itself, was with the other ink of the same type, the other spectrum for that same ink. And then all the other inks had to be below it. So we ignored the self-match and therefore what we called hit number one was actually the next best match. And the ink was correctly identified if that hit number one was the other spectrum for the same ink. Okay, sure. Did you examine two of the same type of a pen, or is that one, one pen of that given make? It was one pen of that given make. We didn't try mixing up uh, different samples of the same of the pen of the same model. Okay. You know, so we didn't have two big uh, Atlantis black ballpoints and use one for one spectrum and one for another. Oh we no, would, I just meant if. Are you classifying by it matched that single pen, or are you trying to say it matches that class of pen? Well, we had usually only one pen okay. for a given make and model of okay. ink. So all the spectra for that given ink came from that same pen. So okay. we did not compare whether so things were stable across them. different pens of the same model. Okay. Uh, other people who have done ink analysis have said that for modern, uh, you know, first world country 
manufacturing I think is very uh, stable from one pen to the next. Some people do claim they can see small differences between batches of ink. You know, if you've got 20 pens made from this batch of ink and then the manufacturers made another batch of ink and you've got 20 pens, you can't tell the difference among those 20 pens here, but you can tell differences between the two batches, a pen from that batch and a pen from that batch. We haven't tried to do that yet. We don't have a, a close enough relationship with an ink manufacturer to reliably get pens that we know are from two different batches of ink and do that sort of comparison. So for now we're just testing whether we can tell one ink model from another ink model in terms of pen model. I should say pen model rather than ink model because a manufacturer might use the same ink in more than one pen model. Anyway, here are our results. Bow points went really well. Blue bow points, absolutely perfect. Every one of them matched up with its cohort. Among the black bow points, almost. We had 48 inks, so that was 96 spectral we were matching, and one came out wrong, so 99%. The gels do pretty well as well, 93 and 97%. There are a few mismatches. Again, the fluids were the problem because they sink into the paper and give weaker dart spectra. Still, 81% correct matches for the black ball points and 77% for the blue ball points. So usually right. Overall aggregate of 92% correct. That's sort of the broad stroke picture of the identification results. Let's look at a little of the detail. We look at the errors first. The one and only black ballpoint error was a Papermate Flex Grip Elite pen, which matched with a Papermate Flex Grip Ultra. That might be a case that I just mentioned where the same ink is being used by a manufacturer in two different models since they are both Flex Grip pens. We don't know. In terms of how we defined our test, we are calling that an error, but it might actually not be. Among the black gels, both samples of the Pentel Sunburst gel uh, misbehaved. One matched with a Parker gel and another matched with an Integra roller gel. Parker gel was an interesting one in that it tended to have fewer peaks than the other things and it tended to have the peaks that showed up in all the other gel pens. So it was sort of a typical gel pen. So even though it usually wasn't picked as hit number one in a test, a search, it often was hit number two or three or four because it would match with everything reasonably well. <laughs> but it probably is just the formula of the Parker gel ink. Uh, Zebra gel three matched with that same Parker ink. It, as I say, it kind of came up high in a lot of the matches. Among the blue gels, the Pentel Hybrid H2 matched with Pentel Sunburst. Ah, Sunburst, same thing up here. That Sunburst ink was sort of the reverse of the Parker in that, you know, matching with everything. It didn't match with anything. It didn't match with itself. The spectrum, you know, we took the spectrum several times and we kept getting a different sort of spectrum each time. It wasn't nearly as reproducible as the other inks. Don't know why. Fluids, I can't really go into details because there were a fairly large number of mismatches, 10 among the black, 11 among the blue. Can see some pattern. Uh, both samples of the Espresso ink among the blacks and one of the Espressos among the blues mismatched. Apparently, again, it's a case where the reproducibility isn't so hot for that particular ink. I think there was another example of that somewhere on here. Yes, the. Uh, Schaefer Slim Rollerball, both of them among the blues and one of them among the blacks did not behave. So those two inks by themselves count for six of the 21 errors up there. Well, we can do plots again to give an idea of how things are distributed. Here we're looking at what was the match quality for the correct match for all of the black ball points and the match quality of the First, the closest incorrect match, to give you an idea of how much of a separation there was between the correct match and the wrong match. And for the black ball points, it's generally a pretty large gap because the match qualities for the correct match are all nice and high, and the next match, which is the wrong ones, is usually fairly far down, even down here close to 500, which is 
really <laughs> not a match at all. Among the blue ball points, same sort of thing. Correct matches were all nice and high match quality. First incorrect match was much lower down. We even had several that were below 400. I'm not sure how you get below 400. <laughs> not quite as good a separation among the gels, but still pretty good, except for that sunburst I mentioned that simply doesn't behave. The matches for the correct, the match qualities for the correct matches are all reasonably high, and those for the first incorrect match are all, are mostly fairly below that even had a few below 300. The only set that didn't work all that well were the fluids again, in that the correct match for some of them got down fairly low. And that's why we had 10 or 11 errors for the two different colors. Still, there were some that were fairly high, but there were some that are definitely down here low. And the first incorrect match again was spread all over the place. Different way of looking at all those plots is simply the numbers. I probably won't uh, bore you too much here. Black ball points, the correct match, the average or the median, depending on how you like the things about things, up in the 880s, 870s. Closest incorrect match, down in the seven or 600s. So the difference between the correct and the incorrect match tended to be as much as 250 points, at least over 100. Uh, gels weren't quite as good, but still pretty good. The correct matches, the average or medians down here near 800. The average or medians of the first incorrect match down around 600 or so. So again, the difference between the correct and the first incorrect is still over 100 all the time. Again, it's the fluids that are the problem. 700s for the correct match, six or 500s for the incorrect match. But the difference between those two does, at some times, get below 100. So the difference between correct and incorrect is smaller for the fluids than it is for the other groups, on average. Finally, the acknowledgment with the boiler, boiler plate that you saw for uh, Pete's talk earlier, National Institute of Justice uh, funded the project. And we have to put in here that the opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this exhibition are those of the author, me, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Justice. Also need to thank John McClellan, who actually is the principal investigator on the project and my boss, and Susan Lorge, a technician we had last summer, who worked out the optimum conditions for taking the data and took a lot of the library data. Thank you.